This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be financial or investment advice. Seek a licensed professional for investment advice about crypto or any other investment. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Blazing Crypto Podcast. We are Brandon and Justin, and today we are recording episode 20 of the Blazing Crypto Podcast. So congratulations, Woo-hoo. Justin. We uh, we made it. All of us made it at least to episode 20. So I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty cool thing to celebrate. On today's episode, we are going to be continuing and maybe finishing our Don't Sleep on Bitcoin series. In the last two episodes, Justin, we talked about the fact that uh, Bitcoin is crypto. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, but crypto isn't Bitcoin, meaning all of the things that are said about crypto and all the things that are true about crypto are not necessarily true in a one-to-one way for Bitcoin. We need to understand Bitcoin as sort of unique uh, and having a unique purpose and solving a unique problem and providing a unique solution. In the second episode in this series, we talked about we really need to think about Bitcoin more as land or treat Bitcoin more like property, which I think was your word, uh, and and not simply like another altcoin, if you will, not simply like Luna or Ripple or Solana, uh, whether it's a good coin or a bad coin. That was the point. It's really more property. And today we're going to talk about Bitcoin being smart money and the fact that I'll argue it's the only smart money. Before we dive in, um, I just want to acknowledge, right, like with with something like Bitcoin, we said in the last episode, and I'll tee up again, Bitcoin Satoshi, white papers published in 20, uh, 2009, uh, right on the other side of the financial collapse or correction. Actually, I don't remember when the, the white paper itself, the actual date it was published, 2008 or 2009. Um, it was right when... We went through a pretty massive financial uh, situation back then. But Bitcoin solved a problem that people didn't know yet existed. And it solved it in a way that people didn't understand. And and again, that's sort of my way of explaining why if if Bitcoin seems like a foggy idea, kind of why that is. Or if you're thinking to yourself like, how how could how could Bitcoin sort of be this massive thing, and I didn't even hear about it until twenty four months ago, or I didn't even hear about it until a year ago? You know, sort of how how is that possible, right? And that's kind of yeah. my summary way of understanding it um, or explaining it. But but I wanted to ask you, you know, Justin, a lot of times I think for all of us, for me, for you, it, it's not like we woke up one day and like heard about Bitcoin or read the white paper or read an article and went, oh, I get it. It's probably more like a, a trail and a series of breadcrumbs or puzzle pieces that, that at some point a piece fell into place and suddenly it's kind of like we could see the picture on the box in the yeah. puzzle we were building. Do you remember either 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 when that happened for you or what sort of what pieces fell into place where you thought, oh, like I don't just understand the technical aspects, but I actually sort of see the big picture. Yeah, for me, the kind of like how you described it, I it seems like I've almost always understood the technical aspects of it. I mean, I know I've grown in that area, but that's really where I started with Bitcoin was, okay, how does this thing work? Um, and I had to understand that first for me, just the way I think. Um, but I think understanding how something works doesn't necessarily equal conviction or like... Um, kind of like as you're describing it. So I think the big moments for me, because there wasn't any one moment where it was just like, oh, I get it now. Like I I see Bitcoin from a perspective that I never have. But the, the big moments for me were seeing the market evolve and seeing kind of like how we talked about in the last episode or two, seeing these bigger players come into the game like institutions, countries, like we've talked about, and I didn't see Bitcoin um, and point at it and say that, like that is unique, that has value. And they're not just saying that, they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is. Um, so to me, that was, that was a big moment to kind of like see institutional adoption coming in and seeing sort of the, the infrastructure for this whole world of, you know, Bitcoin and crypto being built out. Um, you know, that those were big, big steps along the way for sure. 
Yeah, in my in my experience, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2017 and sort of got to witness sort of up close, at least with a few friends of mine that were buying it, trading it, holding it. Kind of that move from 2000 all the way up to, you know, close to 20,000 in the end of 2017. Certainly my curiosity was peaked, but I think for me, you know, Justin, you, you made some, as you and I talked uh, back in 2018, I mean, you made some, you made some grand and lofty predictions. Um, I, I think I remember, <laughs> I think I remember saying something like, man, if like Bitcoin could just ever get to, and again, you got to remember Bitcoin's trading at, you know, four to $6,000 when I'm saying this, you know, if Bitcoin just gets to $30,000. I'll be, I'll be really, really happy. And you, you were just like, uh, you mean by like next year, <laughs> um, you, you always sort of aimed my, my gaze higher. I think for me, kind of like you said, uh, for me, it's a little bit different. It's like, I, I, I think that I always saw, I always understood the future that Bitcoin, people that supported Bitcoin, the white paper, I always understood in, in a vacuum, the world that it envisioned. It's like, I got, I understood the vision. But yeah. I didn't understand. It just never made sense to me, like practically the gap between where we are today and getting to that point. And you're like, oh, yeah, like I can see that happening, but I have no idea what the trail is, what the path is. Yeah. Um, I guess it's sort of like if you work for a company where they have like this big vision statement, but there's no plan to get there. Um, that's kind of what Bitcoin felt like to me. And then I think for me, um, I was I was sort of legitimately and theoretically bought in to Bitcoin way before the 2020 March 2020 thing with um, you know the the COVID mess. But I remember when the in my, yeah in my conviction was was pretty strong then um, I, I was you know, I was buying as people were even selling that dump. But I remember the first time it was announced that we were going to have a stimulus check. And how that was going to happen. And people started basically like ringing the bell really loudly about quantitative easing, money printing, all the kind of micro and macro economic dynamics of that. Yeah. And I remember that was the time in which like the whole picture became clear to me. Um, and, and, and it went from like a, everyone should know about this to like everyone needs this. It, yeah. Again, it moved from novelty to necessity. And I, for me, at least, sort of the money printing quantitative easing series in, two, in 2020 is really kind of the, you know, the final domino that needed to fall in order for all the other dominoes to start falling. So, yeah, I just thought it was, it was kind of interesting to sort of reflect our purpose really on this show and kind of why we started this whole gig in the first place. I would say one way to understand it is connecting the technical to the the application layer, if you will, connecting the technical to the practical. So again, hopefully today we can continue to, uh, to make, move some, move the needle in that direction. Okay. So we're talking today about Bitcoin is the only smart money. And really we want to make three points today. Um, first of all, Bitcoin actually solves a real economic problem. Some infomercials, if you're watching TV late at night, and maybe later than you should, they almost want to create a problem that you didn't realize you had. They want to like create a, a challenge, right? Like you, you're holding all these things and you drop all of them at one time and they all break and you just never want that to happen again. And that they, they of course, have the perfect solution. If you call now, you get two for nineteen ninety nine. But wait, that, there's more. Yeah, exactly. There's more. Um, exactly. <laughs> but again... It's really tough to understand the solution that is Bitcoin, the network, the token BTC, if you don't understand the real economic problem that sort of uh, predicates why Bitcoin was created in the first place. And, and I, again, I'll allude back to that 2020, 2021. We, we finally realized what pe a lot of people that are like super smart economists have been saying, which is the world not just the U.S., but the world has a fiat currency problem. Yep. So, Justin, just give us an, a few, little bit of an understanding about kind of fiat currency and why we would say there's a problem with that. Well, I think the the very nature the very nature of fiat currency and like what makes it, I would almost call it a circular problem, is 
you know, the government government comes in and they through the Fed, you know, they, they have certain controls over, you know, how much money is being printed and when when they need to do that and when they when they don't need to do that. Um, but I think the circular nature of it is essentially government, you know, over especially over the last two or three years, you know, it's this cycle of printing money to solve problems, but then the fact that they're printing money creates new unique problems. <laughs> And then to solve those problems, they print more money. And it's this endless cycle where, you know, it. I've, I've often described it to people is it's basically like kicking the can down the road. Okay, we're just going to keep printing money until we are no longer incentivized to do that because, because of whatever reason. I mean, the problem becomes so big that simply printing more money no longer it no longer delays or fixes the problem, right? And so that's kind of that that circular nature of, I guess, the the inherent flaws of, of fiat um, and, you know, having a currency where you're, you're essentially manipulating um, the supply dynamics to try to, like, math. it's almost like masking problems. I would almost describe it sometimes as, you know, it's like going to the doctor and you have a terminal illness and they can't they can't fix that right, but they can treat your symptoms. Um, it's not exactly the same, but to me, that's that's sort of what happens um, with this money printing stuff. Yeah, and a couple points there. We've mentioned this before, but just to be fair, obviously, I mean, the U.S. dollar it, again, it was designed to be inflationary, so inherently inflation by itself inflation just as an idea is not a a problem right uh inflation has to exist in order for supply and circulation to actually function uh u.s dollar was not obviously not meant for to be collected it was meant to be circulated right so exactly but but I, i agree with you that sort of solving one problem with the cause of the problem and we just sort of keep keep repeating that on 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 cycle 80 percent and I don't know what the, the this stat is today, but as of the end of December of 2021, as of the end of the year 2021, 80% of all U.S. dollars that were currently in circulation were printed in, in the 22-month period that preceded that, basically yeah. from March 2020 to December 2021. Um, uh, we went from $4 trillion to $20 trillion uh, from a Federal Reserve standpoint. Uh, and again, those numbers in one sense don't mean much in a vacuum. Those numbers need a lot of context. Um, you know, I am not necessarily, I'm not critical of the Fed for stepping in and taking action. Um, I just I just think we probably responded a bit too strongly. Um, but I'm not going to get into that, uh, that, that can of worms today. Yeah. Um, one thing we want to talk about... Um, and I think it's important here. So just try to try to try sort of hold hold on to this in your in your brain. And this is pretty easy to find on Google. Um, but there, and this is something that I've said in the past: understanding Bitcoin or being forced to understand Bitcoin and ask questions has actually made me understand our fiat currency system a lot better. Like I really didn't understand how the whole thing worked. What were kind of the moving pieces? What were the trips and triggers? You know, the dangers, the benefits. But there, there are essentially three functions for money. And this is this has nothing to do with the U.S. dollar. It's just true of currency in general. Um, money serves as a medium of exchange. You know, Justin and I both have items we're selling. Dollars is how we exchange value uh, thing for thing. Secondly, it's a store of value. Uh, it, it, it has value. It, you know, you can keep it. And not be afraid that that value is going to just deteriorate or disappear. Um, we talk about things like people's net worth, right? Like <laughs> we communicate that in the denominator of dollars. Uh, and, and we're like, yeah, like that's that means something, right? And then finally, sort of related to that is that money serves as a unit of account, which means money, a currency, is a ruler by which other values are also measured. So you understand when we say something is a good deal, Right, what you're saying is, wow, I can't believe I got to exchange twenty dollars 
for that pair of shoes, that pair of shoes is normally $80. It's a, it's a, it's a unit of account. And, and so that's just a classical definition of function for currency in general. And what we're essentially saying on this episode is Bitcoin is actually a smarter version or the smartest version of money. So Justin, you know, medium of exchange, store of value, and unit of account. Does Bitcoin actually accomplish those three things to technically be classically defined or categorized as money? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, depending on what asset class you're talking about, well, first of all, those three those three things can change, okay, over time for any specific asset class. So, um, you know, I think as, as you were going through those things, uh, I was thinking, okay, the U.S. dollar, the store of value argument now, you know, is a lot. It it's a lot lower than it was, let's say, eighty years ago, right? So these things change over time. And we're talking but about U.S. I, dollar. Is that yes, what you sorry, mean, U.S. Yeah, dollar for U.S. dollar? So you know, in the U.S. dollar standpoint, you know, it's it's stronger or weaker in in those different three areas, and that changes over time. But I think you know one of the things that I think make makes Bitcoin unique is how, just how strong it is in in all of those areas. Um, yeah, and, and some of them stronger than others, but definitely like it checks those boxes and it checks those boxes better than any other asset that I know of, um, not just currently, but in in our history. Yeah, and and to be fair, so the first point we we said was Bitcoin solves a real economic problem. You know, I want to be very clear, and, and this is sort of something I'm really passionate about in life. Simply diagnosing a problem does not mean that the thing that you like, the thing that I like as the solution, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it solves the problem, right? Diagnosing the problem, identifying a solution are separate things. And it's important that sort of each of those be treated in their own right on their own merit. So the first point was that Bitcoin solves a real economic problem. Our second point is really that that Bitcoin is the only smart money that exists. Uh, and so getting into that, we've seen this all over the place, but the rise the rise uh, of the internet it accelerated everything. Yep. And. Once we saw, you know, moving things from analog to digital uh, with Web 1, Web 2 was all about mobile and social. So building out networks. Uh, we have networks now for payment. We have networks for, you know, data, content, you know, connections. Um, but then, you, you know, you see the rise of things like Uber. Well, what was, what was Uber, right? Again, we can talk about decentralized, this, that, and the other. But in one sense, tech... Someone used tech to find a massive inefficiency in the market. Yeah. These cab companies that, that basically all function the same but have to be locally run, owned, and managed and, and certified. And someone said, yeah, I can, I can do something better than that, and I can do it with software. And so I, I want to set that up to say, <laughs> although a lot of the thinking behind the U.S. economy is very impressive, uh, and I don't want to discount that, from a technology standpoint, it's very inefficient, and it's and archaic, like right, archaic as it possibly could be, <laughs> right, yeah. And I'm, I'm maybe inefficient is sort of like a, a dry term for that. What I mean is, yeah. it, I mean it's not evolving. It's not becoming like a lot, a lot more technologically engaged and enabled. I mean, again, ACH payment takes three, four, five business days to actually settle. I mean, this like what. The year's 2022, and I'm like moving around to banks just to, to get cash in the bank from a different account before the end of next week or whatever. That, so, that's been around. Sorry, that's that technology that we're currently running on. Yes, it's been updated and sort of like masked over time because of the internet and it makes things easier. But at the core, you know, our banking system, ACH, all of that is is the same technology as it was in the 1970s. Literally, like it's that old. Yeah. Um, so just because you know you put a website on something and make certain aspects of it a little faster, it doesn't mean like that doesn't discount the fact that the engine is still 
really old right. and broken inside. Yeah, and, and the web the web really gave interface, mobile technology gave interface right. to a really old system that again, it, it, for for some people didn't really need to be changed or updated or evolved. I say all that to say with blockchain and Bitcoin, you know, with Bitcoin blockchain was invented, you know, Bitcoin's the first blockchain. You know, with blockchain we got something that we've just never had before. Um, and and that's why, you know, my view, you know, my view is that is that Bitcoin has has disrupted and will continue to disrupt fiat currency in general, including including the US dollar. So when I I'll say this, when I buy Bitcoin, I'm I'm not really viewing it like Sometimes when you buy things, you feel the risk, right? You feel risk of I'm 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 trading U.S. dollars for something that may lose value, and I think for me certainly there's the risk, right? I mean, Bitcoin U.S. dollar that 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 relationship moves up and down. I think for me it's more like I'm tr- I, I legitimately feel like I'm trading something from an old system into a new system. Um, like I feel like I'm buying the future rather than sort of like hoarding the past. Is that, is that too strong? No, I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> I'm probably, then, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably asking the wrong person. Right? Yeah, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> well, the funny thing, and I think, I think I like the way you explain that because, you know, if you were, let's say you weren't, however old you are, 33, 34, 35, Six. Uh, 36, man. Oh, that's right. You very just had a birth, old. Very, just had a birth very day. old. I forgot. Very old. Antiquated. So, you know, if you were like 70, okay, or 65, you're, you are not going to need to feel the, uh, I guess, the urgency, or that might be too strong of a word, to embrace the future. You may not feel as comfortable embracing the future because you don't need to, right? So um, I think, you know, that speaks to the to the fact of you and I. We're not sitting here talking about these this you know this currency situation and expecting everyone in the world to just on a dime realize oh Bitcoin is this cool thing. I need to fully embrace that and dump U.S. dollars right. But you know as time goes on, um, I don't know how to say, I don't know how to say it nicely. And generations, you know, pass. There's going to be there already is a new newer generation. You know these. And millennials that are coming up and and their view of all of this this currency stuff bitcoin embracing the future is is very different than older generation and that's just out of reality and necessity so in talking about bitcoin being the smart money we, we that was kind of a long setup to sort of explain what we mean by that and kind of while we're talking about it there's a couple points we need to make here um and i think these are really important that that we talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is technically software in a network. BTC is it is the the token of the network. So we kind of use those interchangeably. But but Bitcoin or BTC is a tech asset. It is a currency. And in reality, again, Bitcoin is a network. Yep. And it's it's really, it's the first, I just lost my, my place on my, my notes here. It's the first thing to be generic. It's the first thing to ever achieve all three of those. And so if you look at gold, or real estate, or a stock, it's an asset. It's not currency. And it's not a network, right? Yeah. If you look at the U.S. dollar, the U.S. dollar fulfills all the, meets all the requirements to be currency, but the U.S. dollar is not an asset. Uh, you know, it, it can't. It, it, you could argue that it's a network uh, in one sense, but not not in the way we're defining it. And so the point is, there has never been something that combined asset, currency, and network in one thing. And and I'll say this. I mean, that's part of our our frustration with like the IRS tax code is. From a tax standpoint, Bitcoin is treated like an asset, but it's not treated like any of the other stuff, right? And so it's like yeah. you have all these uses that fall under a tax. Anyway, that, that's a different uh, topic for a different day. 
so Justin, how how do you how do you get your your mind around that? What what is that? Uh, what does that trigger for you? That, that Bitcoin's really the first fintech asset currency network all combined into one thing. I think the first word that comes to mind is unique. Like holy cow, this thing is unique, um, and it's it's almost like I don't know, what are those things called? Is it Venn diagram? Where you've got like the bubbles yeah. that intersect, you know, from different, yeah, it, it's like a Venn diagram, um, where you have, you have those, you know, the technology, the currency, um, asset classes kind of like merging into one and where they overlap, right. Is, is Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, that's the uniqueness jumps out to me and automatically, you know, obviously the next step when I see something unique, um, and I see that it's early my instinct is okay. I want to buy that thing. Like I, that's, that's an area where, um, you know, we could, we could see a continual immense growth for sure. Yeah. One really interesting thing. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't mean to trivialize the situation at all, but just to, to point out a real life scenario, um, where again, I'll say crypto in this case, cause it's probably the more accurate term. Crypto went from novelty to necessity in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And actually, both of them experienced this. So, obviously, in Ukraine, they had a pretty massive uh, just national currency issue, right? I mean, obviously, bank runs, people going to get their money, people that want to leave, and they need their cash. Uh, and that was kind of a mess. And essentially, it's like if the banks were closed... You can't, I mean, if you can't get your money, you got nothing, right? And obviously, yeah. very, uh, feel very sorry for a lot of those people. Um, a, a month ago, an article was published um, that the Ukrainian government had raised $64 million through more than 120,000 crypto asset donations uh, since the start of the, the conflict and the, the invasion. Um, and that included $6 million from the Polkadot founder, uh, which is a, a blockchain. Uh, Gavin Wood, and then somebody actually donated an NFT worth over 200k, which is you know kind of wild. But but the point the point there is, you know, that didn't have to go through 18 different hands to get there. It, it was really it's one of those things where I mean, crypto settles in 15 minutes or less, right? And and it can yeah. be sent to a wallet, and that mass um, uh, mobilization of of aid, even again, it just demonstrates. You're able to send something to anybody in the world. It doesn't have to be sent from U.S. dollars to Ukrainian this to Russian that. Um, but even Russia got in on the act, and they were—I mean, they were—they were stuck with all the sanctions, right? And 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 they had previously banned Bitcoin, and sort of found the need to to reverse that ban and actually accept Bitcoin for, uh, I think, for buying fuel, oil, whatever it was. Yeah. And they found that it's like, oh, like here's a a censorship resistant. Um, like the U.S. government can't can't block Bitcoin, and Bitcoin yep. is able to be traded across the world. Oh wow! Like this solves a lot of problems we have. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say on the record, I mean, I had people texting me saying, "Hey, like, aren't you upset? Aren't you upset that Russia is able to use Bitcoin? Like, why don't they shut that down?" And I'm like, "Well, first of all, who is they? You know, <laughs> yeah. are you talking about us? You, yeah. the, the network, like." And again, I'm not I'm not happy about what Russia is doing, but in one sense, it, it in a bad situation, you're like, oh wow, like most of the countries in the world want to stop this, and they're not able to. Yeah, like that's that's actually a really strong use case for the asset. Again, not happy about the situation, and that's not the point. But you're like, dude, if you wanted to see that thing truck excuse me, tried and tested and come through. I mean, we just, we kind of just saw yeah. it. Yeah. And I think a lot of eyes are watching and, you know, ultimately kind of like, I, I think what it highlights is underneath all of that, what you just stated is, is it highlights that need, right. That we're talking about the end, the real, the real problem. Um, but just, yeah. just like, you know, with, with this technology, it's like, it's, you can see it from both angles. Okay, it it's in one aspect, it's saving and helping a lot of people in Ukraine. 
Um, but then on the other side of it, yeah, it, it is a it is permissionless and decentralized. So Russia is also able to use it to like you know solve problems from their perspective. It is what it is, and I think this could be. I, I think the whole situation is a real catalyst for sure. Yeah, and it's not our, our. We're not trying to dig into a geopolitical conflict here. It, the point is to say, I mean, it, it's a tool, it's an asset, it's being utilized for good, for evil, whatever. Um, you know, yep. so is the U.S. dollar. So welcome, to, welcome to that. Welcome to twenty twenty two. And yeah, for the people that argue, oh, Bitcoin is silly internet money. Yeah. I would say, yeah, and Uber is a silly internet cab company, right? Like, yep. fine. You know, feel free to say that, but that really misses the mark and people are sort of retreating to their priors. And they're basically saying, thing I don't understand must be stupid because I don't understand it. People and again, said that about cell phones in like yeah. the early days too. <laughs> like right. Silly little cell phones. Yeah. Just, why would I need that? <laughs> yeah, I feel I feel no further need to to defend to defend something that doesn't need to be defended. The last point under the smart money category, and we said this a hundred times before, but it, it, Bitcoin was designed, it was designed to be, I, I say it's deflationary, Justin, you and I have had, had discussions yeah. about that. From a relative standpoint, it is deflationary compared to an inflationary currency like the US dollar. Now, it's not deflationary in the sense that, that Bitcoin is being burned, meaning like Bitcoin, the supply is not being intentionally reduced, right? People have lost their Bitcoin, so... There, there is technically twenty percent less Bitcoin than there than there had planned to be because people lost it. So it is deflationary, but it's really more to say there is a fixed supply. You know how much exists and doesn't exist, versus all of these fiat currencies, where if the government decides to print twenty percent more U.S. dollars into circulation, you basically inflation is basically a tax that you don't you don't agree to. Yeah. Oh yeah. Very, very hidden tax. So again, anything we say, I mean, feel free to, to verify it, validate it, research this on your own. Um, but again, there is a real economic problem that needs to be solved. And like I told a few friends of mine, you know, I, I'm a few friends of mine see me as kind of the crazy Bitcoin guy, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, fine. Um, but I just said one day I told them, guys, you don't have to buy Bitcoin. But you do have to figure out how you're going to solve this current situation we're in. That that's that's on you to figure out. And if you're listening to this episode, you've got some things to figure out, and you need to figure out how you're going to solve the situation we're in. And if that if the situation we're in doesn't seem uh, troublesome at all, I'd say pretty confidently you don't understand it very well. <laughs> and I'm again, I am I am not a doomsdayer. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I like actively reject a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'm just sort of reading what's on the page and not closing my eyes to it. All right. So Bitcoin tells a real economic problem. Bitcoin is the only smart money that exists. And kind of a weird point, but one that I, I'm excited about is that third and finally, Bitcoin is the first ever global opt-out currency. Justin, what do we, what do we mean by that? Well, I think the... Yeah, I mean, you're, you're already sort of seeing that you know it, it's already happening essentially um if you look in the right places so um el salvador for example you know like establishing it as a um an official oh, the word's escaping me but basically it, it's an it's an official currency in el salvador other countries like legal Mexico, legal tender legal, legal tender thank you um other countries like mexico a, a lot of a lot of countries in south america are kind of like looking at what El Salvador did and, and kind of like seeing how it plays out. Right. And, and they're next as far as like, you know, approaching that decision. But I think the cool thing about it is, you know, it gives a, it gives a country and a people, no matter where you are in the world, access to, yeah, a, a, a currency that, that cannot be, muted or controlled like we talked about with ukraine that's immensely valuable to them so i think as far as it relates to global opt-out what we're seeing is countries and peoples that are in more dire circumstances they're in sort of emergency situations 
they're the first movers on kind of like a fully, as you say, fully embracing this Bitcoin thing. And I believe, you know, eventually it's not just going to be people in emergency situations or countries in emergency situations. It's going to be the stronger companies and they may be opting into Bitcoin or adding it, you know, as a, as a, you know, a currency because they don't want to be in a dire situation. You know, they're going to start to see the tables are turning and say, okay, like, yeah, we need a piece of this pie. So I think the, the global opt out part is already, it's already happening. It's just happening in little situations. Um, and as soon as, as soon as a country is pushed into a corner where it sees, okay, Bitcoin solves this problem, then they adapt. Um, and it's just going to keep, in my opinion, it's going to keep slowly growing from there. Yeah. So you address that, that topic from a, and there's definitely multiple angles, a sort of prism, you know, views here. You address that from sort of a, an organizational, institutional, governmental yeah. perspective. Um, I'll address it from a, an individual citizen perspective. You know, prior to Bitcoin, take Bitcoin off the table for a second. You know, if I'm a, pick a country, if I live in Finland, and I, I know almost nothing about Finland other, other than where it is on the map and its capital city. Um, if I'm in Finland and I don't, I don't trust my government and I'm afraid and I see kind of the writing on the wall and like I see the government making bad decisions financially and I and I need a way to protect myself. I need a way to um, kind of prevent personal economic financial collapse. You know, what are my options? And, and really, I think, you know, buying gold has always been an out. Like in other words, if you have if you have gold or if you have some kind of access to some like uh, environmental resource, right? I mean, people don't have access to oil unless it's in their backyard and whatever. That's a yeah. different situation. Um, but it's like you can buy gold because gold in theory has value everywhere, but you have massive problems of storage, transportation problems. Yeah. It's very, it's very easy to seize that, right? I mean, how much gold can you store and it not be, you know, fairly obvious or easy to find because it's a metal, but it's like, you know, you owning a, another country's currency it is not very practical because you can't use it in your country, right? Like, the point is, all all of the roads are dead ends, yeah. and 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 really, the only option you would have is to leave the country. And some people, some people do. Again, nothing against the good people of Finland. I knew almost nothing about Finland. However, however, with Bitcoin, someone in Finland could say, or any other country. I I don't like what's happening, and I want to trade my Finlandian dollars for Bitcoin, and they can do that without permission. They can do that without intermediary. They can do that with all they need is the internet. Uh, and really, and we saw this happen a little bit in Ukraine. If they have to leave their country, all they need is their you know, their keys or whatever they have their Bitcoin on or whatever, and they can go anywhere in the world and set up shop. And 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 they would have preserved their value, their financial, their finan their, their financial value. So when when I mentioned that it's a global opt out currency. You know, I'm really saying that Bitcoin is the first opportunity in the history of the world for a citizen of a country to essentially say, I don't trust either. I don't trust my government from a, that they're going to do good and fulfill sort of what I think is their God honor, God um, given responsibility as a government. Um, or I don't trust that they have the, the competency to actually execute right. on what needs to be executed. So this may, this may sound a little bit strong to you, um, the audience, but, in one sense, I kind of view Bitcoin as a little bit of a way to almost like, it's almost a bit of protest. It's almost a way to say, um, when I trade US dollars for Bitcoin, I, like in my view, at least personally, I'm sort of saying I either need at minimum insurance against what the government is doing or I don't. I actually don't believe that what the government is doing is the best thing, and I'm actually looking for protection, if you will, um, financial stability in a in another vehicle in another medium. And it, again, I don't want you to hear that as like 
uh, I, I'm not a doomsdayer at all, and in, in really in any way. Um, you know, I, I think that we're built to figure out problems. So we have new problems. We'll figure them out. But what I want everyone to understand is that, that Bitcoin, never in the history of the world, has something even existed like that. Um, and Bitcoin does offer that. So people in Venezuela, in Nigeria, in Ukraine that are in dire situations, um, they, they, they do have the option of buying Bitcoin. And they've had that option, right? Now, I understand that, you know, information and stuff travel slowly in some cases, but... So yeah, Justin, any any final points on that from a global opt out perspective, or any other any other points that that we didn't get to in the episode that you wanted to make? I think the only thing I would say is like, um, it's easy to hear what we're talking about describing and dismiss it. I think because we're Americans and we mm-hmm. like, thankfully, we have not had these problems um, like some of these other places around the world or at least they haven't shown up yet sorry right yeah (laughs) well like i think you. i agree i I agree with you i think you know what i mean um so it's easy to dismiss it um i would encourage people that are dismissive of it to start looking around and listening right like research and listen to people that are in those places where they don't have that security and Mm -hmm. you know it's funny Going back to what you mentioned, uh, you had a little rant in our last episode about, you know... A little one? Just yeah. a little one? <laughs> about volatility in crypto. Like, those people, they don't give a crap about volatility. They just don't want it to go to zero, right? Like, they they, they don't want... Which their... which people are we talking about? Yeah, people, people in Nigeria, Venezuela, oh, yeah. Ukraine. Like, the reason they don't they don't mind Bitcoin's volatility is because they're not like, they're not buying it. um, They're not buying it with that in mind, right? They're, they're being forced into a corner where, like we said, it solves a real problem for them. Um, Yeah. And I think when you start to see it from that angle, okay, now I get why, now I kind of get why all these people are, are doing this. It's not because they're, trying to get rich quick or anything like that is trying to solve a real problem for them. Yeah. And a couple of things, I mean, uh, to, to clarify my statement, I don't want to be seen as like a revolutionary or something like that. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not anti-government. Um, I, there's a definite place and need for government and, and hopefully good government. Um, my statements also are not about which party is in control. Um, it's more about how you know a government that that only sees bigger government as, as a path <laughs> um, yeah. that does concern me as a citizen. And again, like we said at the outset, that we're going to solve our economic problems uh, by printing more money. Again, I, as a citizen, I look at that and say, yeah, I don't. I really don't think this is the right approach. And again, as a, as a citizen, you have your right to a you know your view on that. I have a right to my view on that, and we have our ability and. Uh, autonomy to act accordingly, right? And so in the same way that people, and again, this is something I've come to understand more in the last couple of years, when the dollar is strong relative to other, you know, other financial, you know, currencies and, 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 and markets, when the dollar is strong, the markets go down. Why? Because people want to be in dollars. When the dollar is weak, equities go up, assets go up, other markets go up. So again, that the, what I'm talking about is really always just the nature of the of the beast. But what I'm saying is, Bitcoin offers kind of like a a Z axis. It's almost like a, it puts it in a third dimension, where it's not simply trading off of what's stronger or weaker. It's actually it's actually not tied to the U.S. GDP or the GDP of any country. It's not tied to a U.S. company or a, a global company. And again. Our, our really our point is in this episode in this series is that Bitcoin is unique and you need to understand the problem it solves and its sort of problem solution matrix, like how it actually solves the problem that it claims exists. Um, and and I would say from there, you need to make decisions of how you're going to invest or not invest accordingly. Um, everything that we've said in this episode, other cryptocurrencies, fill in the blank with your sort of favorite one, they don't solve this problem. Right. 
or it would at least be like years and years and years before they now they might be able to be, be like a piece of the puzzle but but they cannot put this entire puzzle together and offer up the solution that we've discussed in this in this podcast so hopefully that was helpful for you guys um our big don't sleep on bitcoin uh episode we don't want to assume bitcoin we want to understand it and act accordingly um if you're enjoying the podcast uh, if you're not, I get it, right? But if you're enjoying the podcast, uh, help us out. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, help us out by sharing it with a friend. Um, uh, help us out by leaving a review, giving us a rating on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps us a lot. We don't ask for a lot of sort of support here. Um, but do that. Do that so that more people can can find out about it, the show. Hopefully, uh, even make better decisions about their financial future uh, for themselves. Uh, But as always, thank you for listening. Uh, We are Justin and Brandon, and we will see you all next time. For more information, check out our website at blazingcrypto.io. Additionally, if you have friends that are new to crypto, share our trailhead videos from our website, which is a great way to get introduced to crypto.